Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, Michael and Matt for Remnant TV. I am in London this week for the Family Life International Conference, which was a huge success, and I'm excited to get back home and report on the, on the success of that event. And as a great big bonus for all the folks back home and around the world who watch Remnant TV, we happen to have the opportunity this evening to interview the great Father Linus Clovis, who I know many of our readers are very familiar with. Father's taking a little time to be with us this evening before catching a very early flight in the morning. Father, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. It's an honor to be interviewed by you. Oh, thank you I, so I'm much. one of your fans. Oh, great. Wow, <laughs> you've made my day. <laughs> I, um, I think if you wouldn't mind, Father, I, would, I think there, a lot of people would just like to know a little something about your background. Maybe we can just start right with where you're from, sure. from St. Lucia. Okay, That's I'm good. from St. Lucia. It's an island in the Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean. Um, it has a... Uh, self checkered history, seven times French, seven times British. We ended up British and we became independent in 1979. Um, so I was born there um, in the whole year, 1950. I have four brothers. And we, all of us, thank God, are uh, practicing Catholics and more, we are actually involved in the pro life movement in various capacities. Oh, that's wonderful. And the island is pre predominantly Catholic to this it day? It used to be. At, at some 40 years ago, before the council, it was 95% um, Catholic, um, as many of the islands um, were. But currently, we're down, the last statistics sh show that we're down to 50% wow. and decreasing. Most of it's due to a proselytization, proselytization by... Um, uh, uh, Protestants um, and fundamentalists of that. So Jehovah Witness, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, um, Baptists, and so on. Is the, I'm, I'm always interested in the question of the traditional Latin Mass around the world. Is it, is it possible to have a traditional Latin Mass on the island? Uh, it's possible when I'm there. I'm the, only one, there. <laughs> I'm the, on, I'm the only one who says it. The, um, the, my bishops, the previous one and the current one, and not very favorable, um, but um, I say it um, whenever I can. I see. Mm -hmm. Tell me something about um, then. Well, your vocation may take too long to go into all the details there, but I understand you were uh, you were ordained by by Pope John Paul II yes. and studied in Rome and yes. all that. How did that? That's an interesting story. How did you get to Rome? Well, I I grew up in London, and my I was here from the age of ten, and in. I thought of, when I was thinking about a, a, a priesthood, and I always wanted to be a priest, and even before I made my first communion, um, I approached the bishops here in England, and none of them were particularly interested. Then I was teaching at the time, I was doing my PhD in mathematics. John Paul was elected in 1978, and I thought, no, I have to go. I, I have to make a decision. And so, that was October. I wrote to the administrator in in Saint Lucia, who was a Jesuit. Um, he was also a Scotsman, and um, I wrote him and told him that I thought I had a vocation. I got a letter back uh, within two weeks, and he said he was coming to London. He came, he met me, and he said, "You're too old to go to Trinidad." I was 29, um, so we'll send you to Rome, and so I ended up in Rome. Not bad. <laughs> and then, um, because of my age, I was considered a, a, um, a, a, um, a late vocation. I was allowed as an artist. I studied for four years, which uh, now I wouldn't do it. Um, I think I lost that a lot of the philosophy. Um, but four years, I managed to get a degree, and um, also then by John Paul. Wow, that's a great story. And then, and then what, was the, uh, what was the journey that led you to the traditional Latin Mass? How did that come about? It's, I've always had a, a, a love for the Mass, um, especially the, the, the Latin Mass. Um, and whilst I was in studying doing mathematics, I'd often go to the Brompton Oratory. Um, after ordination, I had hoped that John Paul, in fact, would... Uh, make it available, which, which didn't happen it, it, until the, well, 88. Um, and so I was among the first to sign up to, to celebrate it. Exactly. And so, so I learned. But prior to that, 
and my spiritual director, Father Hugh Waits, whom I think you know, sure, sure. Um, was a great encouragement, and he, he would say it, and, and so there was that link there. But um, once I signed up in Rome, uh, and I think that also was an indication that I, I was willing to put my head above the parapet, mm -hmm. uh, once I signed up in Rome, I had to at least learn it. Um, then I met um, Michael Davies. Oh, you yes, yes. Yeah. He, didn't, he lived quite close to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there was also encouragement to do so, and um, I started. That's wonderful. Would you, would, did you have a relationship over some years with Michael Davies then? Or? Um, yes, we, we, I read, I, I knew his books. He lived um, just two roads away from us, and um, when he moved later on, Greg was always in touch with him. So, so the, I think the angels have been on our side. They really have, the Lord has really fenced us around as a family. It seems that way. <laughs> yes. It seems that there's a number of priests in your family, I understand, besides yourself, right? Well, I had a, a grand uncle, my father's uncle, mm -hmm. and myself, and I have a nephew. That's wonderful. And then we have two, two others in the seminary. I wonder if you could, one thing that caught my, my eye about your story was something that we wish that we would see happen more in the States. And this is where you took quite a principled stand in favor of pro-life uh, on your island. Mm. And when it moved in the direction of going to legalize abortion, I understand that you actually refused Holy Communion to the, one of the politicians involved with that. Uh, um, is that. First of all, is that true? That's yeah, what I, that, I, I told her that I would not give her communion. Um, in fact, it was the head of state, the, the governor general. And um, she... She happened to be to attend the mass at the cathedral, which I was saying, and um, so I went up to her before mass. In fact, the procession had already begun, so I stopped the procession. I took off my chasuble. I went to, her, and I said, to her, "I'm sorry, Your Excellency, but um, depending, um, Cardinal Ratzinger has written a letter to the bishops indicated that those who publicly support um, abortion should not be admitted to the sacrament." So. Um, with due respect, Your Excellency, I strongly advise you not to come to me for communion because I shall refuse you. And um, I repeated it. <laughs> and people take me very seriously. <laughs> so, what was her response? Silence. Uh, she didn't come. Um, but she did report me to the, um, the Prime Minister. And the Bishop, the Prime Minister reported me to the Bishop, who tackled me on it. And um, so I said to him, Your Grace, I have a serious problem with you, w with what the Prime Minister has said, because the Governor General is a Catholic, and she has a problem with a Catholic priest, and she complains to the head of government, not the head of the church. So I hope, Your Grace, you told the Prime Minister it's none of his business. The other problem I have is the Governor General is a Catholic, and she has a problem with a Catholic priest, and she complains to a non-Catholic. So you did tell him, Your Grace, it's none of his business, didn't you? <laughs> Any so. response to that? <laughs> no, it's a silence. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> so, so, I mean, like I say, we, we are all hoping and praying that more priests will take that sort of a principled mm -hmm. stand. But I'm curious, what, what do you say to those who say, oh, that's politicizing the, the, the Blessed Sacrament and we shouldn't do those things? Um, I look at it as a spiritual battle. Um, and we're talking about the good of souls. The, um, when, when priests do not take a principled stand, you are leading the flock astray. Um, was the stand of John the Baptist political when he told the king, you are committing adultery? When John Fisher took a stand and told the king, you know, you have a wife who is legitimately your wife, you cannot put her aside. Wasn't that political? No, no, I, I don't think it's politicizing at all. We're, we're talking about salvation of souls, and we're talking about human life. And um, the Lord will ask, ask us priests very hard questions, you know, and we better have good answers. Mm -hmm. You know. Speaking of, I'm um, oh, sorry, did, yeah. did you have one? Uh, right. Speaking of, of hard questions, um, when I first became aware of, of you and your work and whatnot, uh, it was over a hard question, and that was, uh, I think you referred to the Holy Father's uh, exhortation of Morris Letizia as a Trojan horse yes. some, some years, some months ago, I guess, maybe two years ago. 
Um, first of all, do you, do you, this seems quite prophetic given what's, what's happening now. Do you still stand by that? And, um, and do you, did you get in a lot of trouble, Father, for saying, uh, for saying that so bluntly yes. and boldly? Um, yes, I still believe it's a Trojan horse. Um, and um, I, my, I have not had any feedback on that. I think the treatment I'm getting now is just ignore him, he'll go away. Mm -hmm. But I won't. I'll continue to, to speak mm -hmm. as I see it. And why, what, what about it? Is there anything that, that, uh, about some of the problematic footnotes and whatnot in the document um, that, that you still think need to be addressed? Or that, are, we, are we past the point where we're even addressing it? Is it just a, a fait accompli that this is a very, very dangerous document? It's, I think it's a fait accompli. I, um, the, the dubia have not been answered. They, they've been ignored, but they won't go away either. Um, and I think we're moving towards the neutralization of humanity vitae. Um, and I think, and the part of the arguments for that, of course, lie in, in the Morris, because uh, as um, I think as Father Chiodi said, the um, humanity vitae has to be reread, reevaluated in light of. And we, we know that um, Amoris Laetitia um, seriously undermines um, our Catholic uh, sexual um, ethics, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that has so so, so I certainly think that it is in fact a, a Trojan horse. Can you say something? I assume you you you're, uh, you've met Cardinal Burke, probably even know him a little bit. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, can, there's a there's a sort of a underground or underlying uh, criticism that we see in the States a lot now, are people saying, well, Cardinal Berg never came along with that formal correction, and we're tired of Cardinal Berg and all of that. And I wonder if you could just help me, as long as, we're, as, long as I have access to you. Our advice to people is to say, no, a cardinal, a prince of the church, when he's going around the world uh, doing as you're doing, warning people of this problem at the highest levels in the church, this, in fact, is not doing, no doing nothing. This no, is doing something. It is. It, it certainly is doing something. Um, I, I'm surprised. First of all, that the uh, the amount of um, the, the number of comments supportive. I, I don't recall any negative comments about what I've said or, or what I've done. Um, I mean, perhaps the some priests and bishops have been certainly my bishop. They've not been exactly supportive, mm -hmm. but um, for among the lay people, I, I've had nothing but support. It's very difficult. It is very, very difficult to to stand up and to say things that are not popular. Mm -hmm. And as a Catholic priest, and I, and I suppose as Catholic in general, we it, we don't we don't want to to criticize even worse attack our hierarchy, our bishops, or certainly the Pope. We really don't want to do so. And the point I've tried to make is that. The Pope and the bishops have one task, namely to transmit what they have received. Our Lord delivered the deposit, the whole deposit of faith to the apostles. They in turn passed it on. Um, throughout the centuries, the two millennia, there, there, has been, there, there, have, there has been confusion over individual points of doctrine. Priests, bishops themselves have actually taught things that are heretical. The church is always met and the problem has been resolved and the deposit has developed. It's, it's become clearer and it's been passed on. What is happening today, sadly, is that the deposit is being buried and we get the impression that um, what we had before is obsolete and that we now have a new paradigm, a new gospel, a new, well, new everything, mm -hmm. which is, in fact, leading st souls astray. And we see it because you, you, I'm a mathematician. You, you look at these statistics. When you, when you look at the, number of, of lap, the amount of lapsation among the young, that tells you something is seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and if the church were... A, a, a corporate body, if we were out to make money and you had such management, I think the shareholders would have <laughs> intervened by now. Um, but, and, and strangely, it's, it is the, the very churches 
that are pushing th this um, new agenda, the ones that are dying. And they're pushing it on those that are thriving. Mm -hmm. You know, the religious orders that are dying are the ones who are trying to drag down those who are thriving. It's, it's, it's obvious, for me, it's obviously satanic. satanic. You know, it is, yes. Mm -hmm. um, God multiplies, Satan divides, if we would put it in mathematical terms. Mm -hmm. You know, everywhere, right through the, the, the Genesis, God is multiplying, we talk, when he creates, created the, the living beings, he blessed them and said, increase and multiply. Mm -hmm. You know, now we have the opposite, not too many, and we have in division constantly. I regard division always as demonic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you say something about uh, our Pope, Pope Francis? Um, do you think he's operating uh, on his own completely in, in sort of a Franciscan vacuum, or do you think this is something of a continuum from the revolution of the Second Vatican, before the Second Vatican Council, but also including and coming coming out of the closet no, at the time no. of the Council? I see, I see it as a continuum. In fact, I gave a talk last year um, in, in Scotland for, for um, Catholic Truth Scotland, and, and I said that um, the, it, it would seem that Francis is the epitome of, of Vatican II. He is Vatican II incarnate, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I still stand by that. Mm -hmm. or, or he's, he, he is not um, a, a blip, no, but rather he's, he's, he's the fruit mm -hmm. of, of what we've been going through, um, even before Vatican II, because already the, 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 the problem is there. St. Saint, Saint Pius the Tenth, in fact, spoke about modernism and how, how it adapts itself. It's, it's like a chameleon, you know, it changes and, 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 is, and it doesn't have the, the courage to appear for what it is. Mm -hmm. Obviously, again, a, a sign of the demonic. When we're talking about such a, such a big issue and such a big problem, I should say, what do you say to lay people who are just trying to raise their children and get through this? I mean, I know resistance is required of priests and bishops mm -hmm. and cardinals and so forth. Um, lay people don't even necessarily have the f facilities or the faculty to, to resist publicly other than with their own friends yeah. and family. What do they do to get through this? What would you, what's your advice to them? Uh, devotion to Our Lady. Um, Father Thwaites, whom I met in, I was in university, um, and he was a chaplain for the university students. I met him, and I tell you, it's a blessed day I met him. Um, because he so brought stability and sanity. You know, he was a priest who was, who just wanted to save souls. That's all he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he kept us, and, and I say us, there were, his, his chaplaincy was full of, of, of um, young people. He, he kept us um, balanced. You know, I mean, one of the things he says that, you know, Mother Church, it can never give us poison. She may not give us the best food, but she can never give us poison. He insisted that we are always um, respectful to the hierarchy and pray for the Pope. And um, when we went on pilgrimage, we, we pray for the Pope. When um, on the particular, the first pilgrimage we went to in, in, in um, Lourdes, he, we came back and we made the resolution that we would have every first Friday Friday nights and first Saturday, we'd have an all-night vigil. And um, that went on for years, mm -hmm. and we'd have a full chapel. And for us, it, for me at the time, and certainly for my, anybody I met, I'd bring them, come and meet Father Thwaites, it was that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so we was, there was a lot of people there, and we would meet and we'd discuss, we had the Legion of Mary, the patricians. So I'd say, first of all, devotion to Our Lady, which is what Father insisted on, mm -hmm. devotion to the Eucharist, which meant Mass, the sacraments, confession, the rosary, and pray, consecration to Our Lady. Um, and, and I can assure you that any devotion you have to Our Blessed Lady will always be rewarded. And I can give you one example. It's, it's a short story. I hope it's a short story. I was principal of St. Mary's College, and we had the groundsman. He was totally illiterate. And um, I know, but I noticed something about him. He'd put a flower near the statue of Our Lady. This, this, this college is St. Mary's College. He put a little a flower there. And the moment I saw that, I thought, this man has devotion to Our Lady. Um, 
he fell ill, and he, in fact, he, he, he had um, um, liver cancer. So he, it was, you know, it was terminal. And in the, he was at, he left hospital and went home. And the school was having a collection. It was a Wednesday, and I suddenly stood up. I was at my desk. It was about 10 o'clock. I was at my desk, and I, I just suddenly stood up. I remember this, doing this so, you know, I picked up the phone and I called the bursa and I said, Miss George, how much have we collected for Anderson? And she told me. I said, okay, let's take it to him now. She said, now, Father? I said, yes, now, right now. And I drove up to, to his home, and the first time I went there, and I arrived, and he went in. He was lying on the bed. He, he was semi-conscious. His wife was there, so I said, we just came to see Anderson. So we went into the bedroom. He's, he was there. And I said, Anderson, it's Father Clovis. And no response. I touched me. Father Clovis, he opened his eyes. And I said to, to um, his, his wife, is it okay if I anoint him? So she said, yes. So I anointed him. And I left the room and she cried out, he's dead. Just like that, you know. I, I was stunned. <laughs> mm. But that's not all. When, so I decided, of course, we had a few arrangements to find out he was not a Catholic. But, which is even more incredible, he was a Catholic. His wife was a Catholic. They, she left the church and she insisted he followed, which he did. And then she joined another church and wanted him to follow. And she, he said, no, he's already left one, he's not leaving two. But he always kept devotion to Our Lady. So when the funeral, of course, the pastor turns up and you know, insists, he says, this is one of theirs. So I said, okay. And I said to Miss George, it's okay. They have the body, we have the soul. <laughs> you know, so devotion to Our Lady will never go amiss. Our Lady will always be there. She, she knows her own. Once you've consecrated yourself to her, and just a little devotion, little flowers, just something, a Hail Mary, you know, I can assure you that at the hour of death, in fact, as we say, Pray for us now and at the hour of our death.